All right, shall we begin? What is history? Is history merely just memorizing a bunch of names, dates, places, and events for a test? Well, to some extent it is. But that's a very static and narrow view of history, one that we don't gain any understanding from, other than knowing which event preceded another. Is history merely causality? If A happens, then does it cause B to happen? If I were to take this book and drop it on the floor, it would land with a thump, right? Then it becomes a historical event. Of course, the book falling is just gravity acting on it. Newton discovered that a long time ago. But it's interesting because for a long time, most of us took a very Newtonian view of history. One event causing another event to happen, all very neat, very tidy, very easy to study. But of course, history isn't that simple. Just as Newtonian physics have been superseded by quantum physics, so has our view of history. We no longer look at events in isolation, but how they interact. Of course, if history were like quantum physics, then every action would have a near infinite number of outcomes. Pretty crazy stuff, right? Right, let's take a look at an event that has shaped our world. And let's look at it from three perspectives. Name and date, cause and effect, and the ripples that it caused. Who can tell me what happened in October 1962? The Cuban crisis. Yes. The Cuban war. Correct. The Cuban peace. Very good. So, so we have the name and the date, let's consider the, 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 the events leading up to it. Leading up to it. Of, course, of course, everything from the, course, everything from the on Big Bang on up led up to it. But for our purposes, we will confine ourselves to events post-World War II. We have America developing the atomic bomb. We have the post-war division of Europe. We have the Berlin Airlift. The Soviet atomic bomb. The NATO alliance and the Warsaw Pact. I'm starting to run out of fingers, so let's just skip ahead a bit. It's 1953. Stalin dies. He is replaced by Khrushchev, who in 1955 denounces Stalin's purges. This angers many of the hardliners who vote him out as first secretary of the Communist Party in 1957. Fortunately for him, he has the backing of the Central Committee and goes on to become premier of the USSR in 1958. 1953. Stalin dies. He is replaced by Khrushchev, who in 1955 denounces Stalin's purges. This angers many of the hardliners who go on to vote him out as secretary of the Communist Party in 1957. Fortunately for him, he has the backing of the Central Committee and goes on to become premier of the Soviet Union in 58. 1953, Stalin dies. He is replaced by Khrushchev, who in 1955 denounces Stalin's purges. This angers many of the hardliners, and they vote him out as first secretary of the Communist Party in 1957. Nikolai Bulganin, a Stalinist, becomes premier of the USSR, and later that same year, Khrushchev winds up dead in Siberia. Uh, don't worry, by the way, I won't hold you responsible for Khrushchev on the test. He's really not that important. Now, 1957 is a very interesting year. The U.S. launches its first artificial satellite, Vanguard 1, to send shockwaves through the USSR and the Warsaw Pact. The Soviet Union succeeds in launching Sputnik 1, the world's first artificial satellite, to send shockwaves through the West. The Soviet Union launches Sputnik 1, which beats the launch of the first U.S. satellite, Vanguard 1, by just a few days. 
The simultaneous development of heavy rockets sends a shockwave on both sides of the Iron Curtain. 1959 sees two rather important events occur. First, after a six-year-long revolution, Fidel Castro takes control of Cuba, and President Eisenhower quietly signs a treaty to place U.S. nuclear missiles in Turkey. Castro comes to the U.S. on a goodwill tour and is snubbed by Eisenhower. He then gets personally courted by Khrushchev with some really good Russian vodka. And when Castro goes to Moscow, Bulganin makes an offhanded racial comment that gets mistranslated, and Castro storms out. As to the missiles in Turkey, they become active in 1962. I'm getting ahead of myself. Castro nationalizes Cuban sugar production by seizing $1 billion of U.S. assets, upsetting quite a few people in Washington. That brings, that brings us to the 1960 presidential, presidential election. election. Very, very, very close race, race in which, which Nixon wins. Kennedy wins. Kennedy wins, but only after a vote in the Senate. So what so does what the new does president, the president do? do? He follows a program that his predecessor, Eisenhower, has developed, training Cuban expatriates to overthrow Castro. However, on the eve of the invasion, he gets cold feet. Nixon holds back U.S. air cover, not wanting to look directly responsible if the invasion doesn't work out. The landings at Trinidad Bay fail. A few days later, President Nixon addresses the American Society of News Editors. He praises the Cuban freedom fighters and rails against the international communist conspiracy, telling the American people that we must be prepared to do whatever is necessary. Kennedy holds back U.S. air cover, hoping for plausible deniability in case things turn out badly. The invasion of the Bay of Pigs fails. A few days later, he addresses the American Society of News Editors and declares that the greatest challenge ever faced by the United States is its struggle with communism. This sets the tone for his future dealings with the USSR and Cuba. Kennedy orders a halt to operations before they even begin, which turns out to be a good thing. Because of a total failure in intelligence gathering by the CIA, Soviet-backed Cuban insurgents land at virtually the same site as the planned U.S. invasion. 